All right, welcome back. Speaking uh, to a student, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, I would tell him in the midst of a critique, I would quote one of these painterly quotes, and um, and eventually he came around to me and he said, "You know what? You speak in riddles." And so, this world of axioms, you know, the the axiomatic, the uh, you know these these uh, these expressions, um, aphorisms, sayings, uh, you know, they they're all over the place, and I want to. Uh, do a little bit of work with those today, just talking about how they benefit you and that sort of thing, as you can see by the title. So, um, but before we do, I want to just thank Karen O oh, again. Thank you for that ongoing uh, monthly uh, donation, uh, Karen. And Ken, uh, who says, Ken M, who says, uh, thank you, Paul, for these outstanding talks. You're making your message more clear all the time. That's my hope. That's my wish. And sometimes, specifically, I think of you, Ken. So, um, uh, that's appreciated. Um, let's get right on it. Uh, I'm going to. Um, I'm going to talk about. Let me let me give you a, a bit of a different start. I was thinking about doing something else, but I'm going to offer you quotes from a lot of different sources today. I'm not going to tell you the names of the persons. I'm just going to tell you that they're there. My recommendation is that you read and read and read anything you can find that's directly from a good, a really good, I say the great painter, find a really, really top painter. Not the average painter, not a, even a painter of our times. Find a really good, a really good painter, somebody you just have always had this love for. And anything you can find that, that resounds as a direct comment by that person about our craft and something that actually appears to be useful, but you don't understand, read these things and save them up somewhere in your mind, even write them down. And one day when you're working, you're gonna find them. They're gonna to come to you as you need them, as you're, as you're resolving issues or as you're working on something, you'll say, oh, I'm doing that, I'm doing X. I'll talk about that application a little bit, but, but the first point I wanna make, and I'm gonna talk about these things, I'm gonna show you all these things, I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna go through this stuff again, so. But uh, remember, this is a key to self-development, right? You have to have words as well as examples of work and things like that. And because painters haven't spoken, really good painters haven't spoken all that much, we're relying on quotes from their students or uh, sometimes from themselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, and even those quotes, you know, when you talk about a student, the ideal thing, of course, is to find a student who himself was a good painter, uh, but he's quoting the master. Now we have a bunch of that from Ang, and I offer you that all the time. Don't hesitate to, uh, to email me and, 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 to, and get that if you want. There's two different uh, translations from Ang that are specific sayings, if you want to put it that, of his great quotes. And, um, and of course, we've got, now we've got a lot from, we've got a number of uh, firsthand uh, Sources close to Sargent, um, and um, well, I'll give you that list in a minute. But <laughs> Gamble's idea was to, if you said, if you're going to borrow, borrow from millionaires. And uh, and so that's what we mean by that. We don't mean somebody you heard something. I mean, one of the things that's most confusing. I get students from time to time, and they come in, and their their head is full of some very very poor quote or an un, a, a, a quote that's not from a great source, but they're using it as if it were something reliable. Well, the problem is you are, as a student, having a hard time deciding what's reliable, you know, what's good. And I'm not trying to separate you from that, which, but I am saying, look, just do your reading. Do your reading. You'll see, and, and I'm talking about read things. Just, just practically, I, you know, from the point of view of the craft, it just practically ignore everything else you see written by anybody else. But whenever you see a quote from a good painter, from, from a top painter, note it, because it will become of use to you at some point in the future. Remember, I'm doing this uh, for, for students, primarily uh, young students, uh, starting students. Get your head full of these things, and you're, gonna, and, and you're never going to regret it. Now, I'm just going to run through some of the quotes, and we'll talk about more of these ideas in a little tiny bit. But let's see if I can... Uh, Let's see if I can get this stuff to turn up here. There we go. 
So in the first place, the quotes I'm going to give you, as I said, I'm not going to give you the behind the quote, who said it. You can copy these all you want, but I don't want to do that. I want you to be the digger, right? So any number of the people that I've read, uh, you know, for whom I found direct quotes are ancient people. You know, the ancients, like one of those, one of those is how do you break a bundle of sticks? Uh, and the answer is one at a time, a classic riddle. How do you break a bundle of sticks? Uh, and you can see how useful that should be to a person trying to solve a problem. And every painting is rather that problem, right? So um, I recommend, uh, so the rest of the quotes on these pages are going to be from Ang, from Sir Joshua Reynolds, and there are plenty of other Royal Academy uh, instructors uh, that, are, that are better than average that are useful. The sergeant, Joseph DeCamp, one of the Boston School, or Tarbell and those guys. The Gamble quotes I'm giving you because they are um, direct hand-me-downs from some of these other people. And, uh, and Putt Farkin, who is the historian. Now, that's one of those things where I'm going to tell you how I use that, but let's, get it when, let's, let's talk about it when we get there. And then Benson and then Monet, right? Monet is the thing about the naive. This is, so this is that body of people. You can find direct quotes from all these different people that apply directly to painting writ large or, and specifically, and I'll talk, try to separate them a bit for you, specifically to Impressionist painting. But I certainly am not including quotes here that are not applicable to both, okay? Uh, in any case, I'm not trying to go through the quotes. I'm not trying to give you all the quotes item by item and explain them. That's the last thing I'm going to do is explain them. Uh, again, the reason for that is they're going to explain themselves. And I'll explain that at the very end, how that's going to work for you, okay? Um, I, I was, um, you know, there's a scripture, you know, in the New Testament that says if you, if you, if you, if you follow the, the uh, doctrine, you'll understand, I'm sorry, if you follow the, if you obey, you'll understand the doctrine. Well, there's something about that. We're trying to figure out how to make these likenesses. And we got these quotes in our head. We got these ideas in our head, and we're trying to make a likeness. And all of a sudden, as you're working, it's you're working out with your own hands. It's your own. It's your own trying to be a better painter, that then is calling for these things. You're looking. You have a search going on for best ways. And these things, if you've filled yourself up with them, are going to really be helpful to you. I should mention, I and I have before a little bit, but when I was a student in an algebra two class in high school. I had a teacher who had walls covered with, and a good teacher, I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, good uh, vibes from that guy and benefits. But he had walls, his whole, like three feet of the wall above the, the chalkboard was, or two feet, was covered with these panels that were aphorisms that you could read from your chair. And I think he was looking to give us the greater wisdom, but he certainly had a love for those things. I don't know if I ever discussed it specifically with my man, just in an offhanded way, comment on how, how distracting they were. But I've been in love with them ever since, and I, and I recommend that you make that your practice of finding great sayings, um, and specific to our craft now. And I am talking about trying to make yourself a good craftsman. Uh, I'm really not talking about as much trying to make yourself into a person who fully understands um, uh, the nature of our form, although that's going to come through when you read enough of these really great guys, the ones that are the ha hallmark uh, or the or they or they uh, that, that actually in their in their performance characterize uh, uh, that unity which which summarizes our form which essentially uh, marks our form and, and and is what we love in our form and all those sorts of things but um, so these are mostly practical and I'll start with this first one because when I was reading Putfark and this is that whole point uh, Putfark is just a historian he's writing a, a He's writing about the history of composition, and it's a worthwhile read, and I forgot the name of the book. I should probably put that up here. The visual order, though, he uses the word visual order. And I remember when I was trying to sort out what you should paint first, second, and third, in the back of my mind, the word eventually popped up, visual order. And I thought, Paul, you're so clever. Well, a connection was made, but I w eventually I realized that I hadn't thought that up. I was reading his book again at some point later, and there he's using the expression. He's describing something, a shift that had happened in composition. To, to from one sort of an order in terms of searching out how composition would work to visual order. And uh, so that was that benefit. And that's what you're going to continue to see, that these kinds of connections are made and they stabilize you uh, in terms of your understanding. So uh, as I've said before, how do you break a bundle of sticks? Everybody understands that. Um, 
if you've been taught any of the great aphorisms that are useful for life, you would have gotten that one. Uh, but read those too. I mean, go ahead and have any of them that you think might apply. Problem solving quotes are always useful. Uh, Ang's thing, get a concept of the thing fixed in your mind and eyes. You'll be pushing shapes around all day long. Now, what I'm going to say about all these quotes is you're going to read them the first time and you're mostly not going to get them. The concept of the thing, I remember just turning that over and over in my mind thinking, this is the key. I can tell this is the key. What is that thing? <laughs> what is a concept of the thing? What does that mean? And it's not for me to explain that to you, even though I've done it. It's for you to actually take on these quotes and, I mean, first of all, find them at their source and verify that they're true. I'm actually one of these people who's written them down and or just remembered them. And then I look back later, I remember I didn't write them word for word. And, and at times I wish I had. Other times I know that I memorized for gist. But uh, here's an expression, a breath rather than elaboration. What is that? But you sense that there's something important here, isn't there? When you're drawing, are you drawing for lots and lots of details or are you drawing with a bigger idea in mind? Uh, here's one, always use just enough paint. And that's, by the way, both of those last two quotes are, all the last three quotes are Ang. And so always use just enough paint. And I mentioned it before, somebody, he, he said that to his students. Uh, and and um, one day they were coming out of the studio and they looked at a guy painting a wall. They looked across, across the street, there's a guy painting a wall. And, and Ang turns to him and he says, that's, that's the right amount of paint. So, so what is that thing, right? And that's where you're, uh, that's where you're going to have to work it out. And my point for you is going to be through this whole thing is to say, don't you see? When you're painting, you're going to be working these out. They're going to actually give clarity and understanding to you that you won't otherwise have. Or you won't have a, f a way of fixing it so you can be a real owner of it. So don't even think for a minute this is that, that you can actually get away without having some sort of a basis. That, I mean, I'm talking about being a long-term good painter. You need to have things fixed. Um, here's here's uh, Reynolds' genius lies in seeing the thing as a whole. And how many times... Did I turn that over and over? What the heck does that mean? What do you actually do? What does that mean, seeing the thing as a whole? Uh, wh why is great character not seen in painting? Because instead of one great form, three small ones are made. And again, that could be related to the breadth rather than elaboration. But that's a puzzler, isn't it? That's Ang again. Uh, make it as like as you can the first time and then make it more like. Now, we, you know that is Bonat's rule. I've mentioned it to you before. But where, how in the world do you apply that, right? And of course, some of these things will be applicable in a partial way to a person who's not an impressionist. Um, for example, a person who's painting parts uh, and then putting them together into a picture. And so it may apply, but, it's, but it'll still be the job. For example, that's why I try to recommend that you draw the thing you see, the shape you see. Uh, make it that as like as you can the first time. The first time you put down the pencil. <laughs> you see what I mean? But that's, now I'm starting to explain. I don't want to be explaining these things as much as I want to present them to you with this idea of you're going to want to work these things out. First of all, collect your own body, your own mass of really valuable stuff from the really great millionaire type sources, the great painters. This, this one above here, I forgot to mention him. He's, uh, this is uh, Kendall, Sergeant Kendall, was Gamble's first teacher. He said, look hard at what you're not drawing. And I think Benson does that. So other people mention the same thing. What is that? What is that? Or just look hard at what you're not drawing. What's it going to do for you? But again, my point to you is you're going to be a good painter if you understand most of these. You're going to be a really good painter if you can understand them in practice. I mean, if, I'm sorry, I say that badly. I'm saying if you can do most of these things in practice, you're going to be okay. But if you can really get them all, at the point you actually apply all these things. In other words, you're working and working away and you realize, oh, that's what that is. Oh, Oh, and then that, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm finding a way to do this thing. But the ideas for your self-improvement are always coming out of somewhere else, right? They're not coming out of your, your brilliant mind, except to the certain degree that, you know, there's an amount of playing with toys that really gives you ideas, and that's hugely important, playing with the stuff, you know what I mean? But, um, but there's that, plus the... Uh, but, but there's also this need to actually have the mind, the, the mind of the painter in your head. So what you're doing with words like this is you're actually having what the kinds of words that come out of a painter's head. And as I said, some of them are less, less understandable. Like this one, a painter must have a roving eye. Now, I think that's just strictly from Gamble. Uh, painter must have a roving eye. Uh, draw, what does that mean? Draw with the darks. So I remember wondering what that was and thinking, is that exclusively drawing whenever you draw? Well, you know, so you have to work that out. Is that 
Is that simply true? By the way, that would be in the class what we call rules of thumb. And you always have to think that through. Are rules of thumb fixed things that you never don't do, right? That's one of the great dilemmas with students is they often find themselves uh, making a religion out of a rule of thumb. And a rule of thumb basically means it isn't always true. <laughs> but mostly true. That's what, what gives it its value. Or most frequently, most useful, you know. Uh, if you're not painting wet into wet, you're not painting. What's that? Shadows are flat. The form is in the lights. Shadows are flat. The form, the form is in the lights. Huh. So um, how do you play with that, though? Do you work that out? Do you Have you even heard words like that? So as you're working along, right? So I'm saying that uh, there are, there's a lot of conversation out there from a lot of good painters, but it's a piece here and a piece there and a piece somewhere else and a piece here. And there's only a handful that you're going to find really, really the key ones. And, uh, but it's a, it's a good enough one to make you a bit of a master, right? I'm going to, oh, did I find that quote? I found a, uh, I just turned up an interesting quote from, uh, I think I'm not going to find it now. Baron Groh, I must have copied this years and years ago. So here's Baron Groh, and he says, he says, conduct the whole thing simultaneously, work in a way in such a way that if the work should be interrupted, there would always be a homogeneity in every part, no matter how advanced the drawing. And, um, and then he also says, and so again, these are the ones you want to take to heart if they're the ones you value. But read Baron Grow. I mean, and find the wherever, wherever you can find the actual quotes. Don't wait, don't, you'll waste a lot of time if you're reading what critics say, what historians say. If you don't see quotations and marks about it, there's going to be a dubious element to it, right? Scholars have this way, because they don't live in the craft, of collecting information. But their understanding of it is never going to come through. God and other good, really good painters have mocked these guys like mercilessly. And you find tons of uh, uh, quotes uh, just in quote lists where the critics are, are mocked for not understanding the form is because they don't work in the form. So the last thing you want to do is somebody's, get somebody's interpretation of what Degas says. Uh, but he's here again, Baron Groh, he says, proceed by the whole by the ensemble, the ensemble of the long lines, of the light and shadow, the ensemble of the overall impression. Ye must never occupy yourself with one part without looking at the whole. And it's again, genius lies in looking at the thing as a whole, right? There's Reynolds. Are you doing the, the, are you doing the head? Look at the feet, and that's the rest. So, uh, but you can see the value, can't you? You should be able to immediately sense the value of those sorts of things. Um, all right, let's see. Yeah, so I've given you that. So thin in the dark, thick in the lights, that's one that you have to work by practice. You have to figure out what that means and why that's important. One of the other ones that I don't include here was from Gamel, and he was saying the surface should be uniform. And now you don't have to believe that, but as a rule of thumb, you'll find that most paintings probably do have a relatively uniform surface, a similar treatment right across the whole plane of the surface part of the unity thing. Not always true though, and I'm not taking anything away from those people who don't. It's just that it's one of those things that comes up as an aphorism, a thing to, to um, uh, consider. By the way, the, 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 the reason I include Gamel in these quotes even though is because the guy was the guy. He was the person who did the work partially with his view on it, actually aiding the student that did the work of digging these things up. Now, a huge part of it was to make himself a better painter, of course, which is what would most of us finally do it for, or originally do it for. But, um, but, but he's really aware of that, that element that, that, um, uh, uh, of uh, applicable, ap applicability whenever he's listening to painters. And he will tend to bring those quotes to you. And you will do the same thing for your students if you've actually learned them. And then, and don't bring them to your students unless you can put them into practice, unless you know what they mean in practice. I really advise against it otherwise. So the naive eye, you know that's Monet, the idea of the innocent eye. That's the eye that doesn't come from the, the, the head knowledge. It's a different form. And by the way, most of these are primarily about impressionism, right? About painting the thing you see uh, here, there's a quote down here, paint the visual, not the actual. And you're painting the visual, not the actual. You have to have this, you have to have this, this clarity that's produced by separation of what it is, but what it is as a thing, as a, as a thing in reality, and just simply be, have to be able to, all you really must do is be able to handle it as a, as a uh, 
color, as a value, as a location in the rectangle, and so on. So, but I'm not, I don't, so again, I don't mean to be explaining these things. There's the big look, the big impression. Uh, these, are, these are code words, right? Are they riddles to you? I mean, this is the question. Are you, if they're riddles to you, work, thinking, work with a question in mind. What is that? Because what is that thing? To quote some <laughs> well-known comedian. Um, let's see, um, the relationships of things. I say, I quote Brackman saying, this to this and that to that. Uh, seeing is seeing relationally, right? And that's another one of those quotes. Majors to minors, greater to lesser. That's you'd get. You'd find that from Ang or anybody else you ever talk to about painting. Uh, the good guys, though, for sure. And um, here's be all over. The, this is true. Now this is the real body of impressionist stuff. Be all over the place at once in the start. Gamble used to say, "Hop, hop, hop." What the heck does that mean? <laughs> right? And and all the horses at once. All the horses. That's all the elements in a painting, and you're working on them all at once. How does that work out, right? And paint as if you're coming out of a fog. Appreciated that comment, Jazz. I hope that was helpful, the um, comment I made to you. Um, paint as if you're coming out of a fog. A lot of people will then wonder if I don't mean that well, that means we're painting a blurry thing or we're making it less blurry, gradually making it less blurry. No, it doesn't mean that. It actually doesn't mean that. And then you might not know that except by looking at the starts by the guys who say such things. Um, so just the right value, the right, the right color, the right value in the right place. I think it's I said the other way around. Uh, cam, comment by DeCamp, by Tarbell, by a number of different Boston school guys. Um, easy to understand, hard to do is, is the follow-up on that. Sargent said, you have to classify the values. What is that? And what do people mean by the magic, by the way? You're always getting into this thing about the magic. Um, what does that even mean? Do you, do you have any idea? And where do you see that quote? Where do you see that quoted? Who says things like that? So let me just go through this just as an idea again, really straightforwardly. And I'm using you, I'm putting this screen up here. Uh, I didn't have it up before, but I'm going to show it to you now um, because th just to talk about these points really specifically. So I made sure I've covered them all, right? And again, I'm saying to you that this is really aimed at a beginning student, at somebody who, who wants to really get that body of, of thinking, which is verbalized from great painters into his, into his, into his, the milieu of his experience, into the, uh, into the recipe, into the, into the construct, right? And what he's trying to, he's trying to make himself a painter and this is gonna be important to him. So yeah, they'll seem like riddles at the beginning because you can't understand them. Um, many of them, I mean, I think every single one of them looked at what was just obscure to me. You can't just come in with understanding. For whatever reason, uh, the English language or language in general is like that. It's all kind of a beating around the bush of truth, right? So, so what are we left with, right? What does that mean in practice is the key, right? And the only way you can figure it out is to practice and to wonder and to wonder. So I would get these things and I would not have a clue what to do with them. But I found that there was a shelf in my brain where they were staying. They were just getting slotted in. <laughs> you know, I wasn't forgetting them. And it was a will of its own sort of a thing. But you don't have to leave it that way. You can write them down on a piece of paper. They'll stick with you. Some people are, find they need to write it down, to, to read it a few times, to, uh, to think about it a while before it's actually part of that thing, and then let it go. And it'll come back. It'll come back as you need it. That's one of the great values of having this, this, this verbal knowledge in your head. It, I'm saying before, it's specific to the craft of painting pictures and making pictures, uh, and I do mean painting or the drawing portion of this thing, but, but what you're, you're finding quotes, you're, trying, you're going down a very narrow path, you're trying to become a good painter, which is why you're talking about this. You can do other kinds, like, well, I've used the word self-development here. You can, you can find wonderful quotes about, that have to do with self-development in general, you know, like, um, like 10,000 hours of well-regulated practice is what it takes to make a good whatever, including a painter. But Suzuki, I think, uh, is the first person who talks about that, um, the musician. But this is all about self-development. And if you want to actually be able to bring yourself along, let's say to, to stabilize and to, um, to formularize and to formalize the, uh, uh, the thinking around you and build it into your actual practice. So they start showing up when you're doing things. Um, they will improve your work, right? 
self-development. Again, I'm just saying borrow from great painters. Don't, don't uh, assume that all the things great painters say, some of them have become obsolete. There's no question about that. But, but the ones that'll stick with you, or you know, there's something about that that you're gonna find that that looks useful, that looks useful. But as Scammell said, borrow from millionaires. And also, by the way, borrow from kindred minds. That say, you could say, I'm gonna borrow from so-and-so, but if the guy's not even working like you, he sounds really bright and people, he's got a nice reputation, use your own eyes, your own judgment, and, and you're looking for that kindred mind, that kindred spirit. Uh, I mentioned before the infrequency of comments by great painters, so that makes them far more valuable, doesn't it? So, um, as I said, I, I, would just, I would just plow through things looking for the quotation marks. <laughs> I, mean, I was so disappointed with the book on, I think it's Mrs. Barrington, Russell Barrington's book on, um, <clears throat> on Leighton, that the few quotes I could find in that book, it was also, it was, it was whoa, golly. And then you take a book like a guy like Julia Cartwright talking about Millet, and she just, I read the other book, Sensier, which is a collection of the writings and that sort of thing where a lot of these came from. And I'm telling you, the quotes that she selected were brilliant. She must, I mean, I wonder if she was a student of painting too. But she was a person who wrote biographies of great people, I think. But in, the, in any case, she wrote this, this biography of, of Millet in which she, she, I mean, it's a great source of many, many quotes. Uh, yeah, make, sh you know, they need to be memorable. That say, don't try to memorize. I mean, I shouldn't say you shouldn't, but I mean, I just find them memorable. But if you're looking for a specific purpose, they're going to be memorable to that purpose. And uh, I would leave it at that. I mean, you can memorize it. You, you have different categories in your mind. You'll remember something somebody said because it applies to life or something like that. Why shouldn't you? Yeah. The one thing you want to learn when you're learning these things as best you can is try to pick up some context. Try to find out the situation that was happening when the guy said it. That's where, uh, like the source below that, in that point, uh, you're talking about uh, Amari Duvall. And the other thing I offer, the thing I call D-E-S-S-I-N, um, uh, which is also Ang quoted from a bunch of other students of Ang, uh, primarily, and what they say about what he did and what he was doing, what his thinking was like. And uh, some of it's conflicting, so you'll, it'll, you know, some of it's useful, some of it's not. Um, uh, but, um, but, but to whatever extent you can find context, like when you're listening to these people describing sergeants' uh, demonstrations, that's context. And you may remember like a line like points and angles. I use that all the time. He's talking about getting the points and angles. He says, never let the plum out of your left hand. Uh, and he talks about points and angles. Those things are memorable points, memorable concepts that sit there. Uh, and again, now I'm going to end this by saying um, they're understood only by use. you gotta, you got to be painting all the time. And I would find that if I read a lot, I would all of a sudden be, I'd be, cramped in my, you know, I'd almost suffer a paralysis, a painting paralysis. So paint, paint, paint while you read, 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 okay? And don't let one get ahead of the other. Um, I often had to stop and just paint, paint, paint until I got hungry again. But, um, but read them all, get them into your mind, and when you need them, they'll show up. This is my experience, and that's what I'm offering you today. Read them, get them into your mind, let them go. They'll turn over in your mind, interestingly enough. They'll actually, your, your brain will be agitated. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost like it's a continuous plowing of a field with the idea of turning up something. And, uh, and then when you need them, you'll find, I've found, that they simply come to mind, like the Pat Farkin quote I started with. All right, well, that was long about something that might seem fairly small and narrow, but, uh, but uh, I hope it's beneficial to you, you guys, particularly you younger guys. And uh, it really pays off over years and years. So get uh, get what you can out of it. Um, thank you again, uh, Ken and uh, Karen. And um, thank you all for your uh, continuing following, uh, uh, your sharing especially, uh, subscribing is much appreciated. And the comments I've been getting. I see that a lot of people want to comment uh, from a more or less theoretical point of view. When I went on truth, you know, I'm tempted to go back and do some more inter conversation about that. But I'm also tempted not to because I don't want to get into abstruse thinking about this stuff. And it sort of starts that right from the beginning. It starts with this idea of what is truth, you know. <laughs> Remember, whenever I talk about all these things, I'm talking about it from a painter's point of view. I look at pictures. I paint pictures. And everything I do is coming straight out of that mind. I don't live in the world of the scholar. I read Kant and all these other guys, Burke, 
I read, uh, you know, I've read Aristotle. I've, you know, these guys on beauty and and Longinus and the Sublime and all, whatever you want. But but the point is, uh, when I'm looking at this stuff, I'm looking at this stuff, like for example, the idea of what they mean by truth. I look at it by looking at paintings. I don't look at it by listening to what somebody said about what there's what 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 you ought to do about something or other. So that's what I mean by abstruse thought or scholarly thought and that sort of thing. I'm not. That's really not my game. So. I really much prefer to have people put it into practice by show, show an example of what you mean, uh, and or we could even look at a picture and then let's have that conversation further about this idea, say an idea like truth. All right, uh, good. Well, thank you all very much, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. And by the way, we are trying to do, I think, within two weeks, a another full uh, a live event, and I'll have more information to you as we go along. I'll try to post something here and elsewhere. All right, great. Have a good painting week. See you soon.